What's up, everyone? How are you all hanging in there? I hope things are all right on your end, but if you're in need of a laugh, or maybe just a good story, this one might do the trick. It's about a guy, that's me confronting the man who's been sleeping with his cheating wife. So grab your popcorn because I'm sitting right outside the guy's house, ready to face him. That's right, I'm about to have a little heart to heart with my wife's affair partner. I caught her cheating three months ago, confronted her about it, and you know what she did? She put on the whole dramatic apology act, saying she wanted to stay together and work things out. So, being the fool that I am, I agreed. We started couples therapy, and she made all the usual promises. That she loved me, wanted to fix things, didn't want a divorce, blah blah blah. She even gave me access to her phone like that was supposed to fix anything. She did say one thing though, just don't get all sneaky with it and start checking behind my back. Sounded like a warning more than a request. She swore up and down that she was committed to rebuilding trust, but surprise surprise, she's still sneaking around with him. I found out and didn't let her know I knew. Now, I've got divorce papers ready to serve her tomorrow, but first, I'm gonna have a little chat with her lover to see just how deep her web of lies really goes. I know they've been talking on the phone like it's nothing, even though I told her she needed to cut off all contact. She lied, of course, said she wasn't talking to him, but the phone records don't lie. They're texting almost every day, and she's just deleting them like that's gonna cover her tracks. What she doesn't realize is that deleting them from her phone doesn't delete them from her iPad. And yeah, I've seen every single message. So right now, I'm parked outside his house, waiting for him or his wife to head off to work. If he goes first, I'm gonna follow him to his office and corner him there. If she leaves first, I'll knock on his door and confront him right here. Let me tell you, I'm an emotional wreck right now, but I knew I had to give everyone here on. Let's back up a little. Last night, I got home from work, made dinner like nothing was wrong, and sat down to eat. She asked me how my day went, and I just said, uneventful. That was it. We had dinner, played with the kids, put them to bed, and pretended like life was normal. Later, we sat in our bedroom watching TV for two hours without saying a word. Finally, she turned to me and said, I'm going to bed, like nothing was wrong. No discussion, no confrontation, nothing. She went to bed, and I stayed up playing video games for a couple of hours. I couldn't sleep worth a damn, though, and by 5 a.m., I was wide awake. I wanted to serve her today because we had a marriage counseling session during lunch, and I figured, why not drop the bomb then? I had already clued in our therapist about my plan. So when we sat down, I didn't waste any time. I came right out with it and said, I talked to your affair partner yesterday. She didn't even flinch. Yeah, I talked to him too, she said, all calm. I couldn't believe the nerve of her. I know, I replied. I just don't get why you'd go talk to him behind my back. She shrugged and said, because I needed answers, and you weren't being honest with me. That's when I dropped the hammer. He sold you out, I said. She looked confused. What do you mean? So I told her. He told me everything, the sneaking around, the secret meetings, the late night calls. He didn't hold back. She started bawling right there. And that's when I knew, while she's been feeding me lies, her actions were telling me the real story. I'm done. I handed her the divorce papers and said, I want a divorce. She stared at the papers like they were poison, then looked at the therapist, pleading for help. How do I fix this? I don't want a divorce. I want you. I want our life, our family. I want to stay. The therapist chimed in, calmly explaining that my decision came from the fact that her actions and words didn't match up. And the truth is, actions always speak louder. I've seen enough to know there's no fixing this. The rest of the session was surprisingly civil, with both of us in tears. I told her how betrayed I felt, how she clearly thought I was too stupid to figure out what she was doing. 
She cried because her fantasy life was crumbling around her. After the session, we walked outside, and she grabbed my hand, begging for one last chance at forgiveness. I pulled away and told her straight, I'm done. I don't want you in my life anymore. She collapsed on the ground, sobbing, but I didn't look back. I left her there and drove away. After that, I called the affair partner's wife and left her a voicemail, asking her to call me back ASAP. Then I rang my attorney, told her to file the papers, but hold off on the restraining order unless things got ugly. Sure enough, my wife blew up my phone with calls and texts after I left, but I haven't listened to any of them yet. I felt completely numb as I drove to her parents' house. Just before I went inside, my phone rang. It was the affair partner's wife calling me back. Turns out, he hadn't told her a thing. I asked if we could meet in person, and she agreed. We set a time and place, and then I went into wife's parents' house and laid it all out. Her mom immediately started crying, but her dad just sat there, cold as ice. I told them I loved her, tried to make things work, but I wasn't going to stand by while she kept cheating on me. They were in shock, clearly shaken by everything. I told them I wouldn't spread the truth around to everyone we know, but they needed to understand why we were divorcing. I told her parents straight up that I wasn't expecting them to take my side in all of this. In fact, I told them I hope they rally around her because she's gonna need every bit of their help. At the end of the day, this comes down to my kids. If she can't afford a decent place to live, I don't want my kids staying somewhere run down during their time with her. Her parents have the means, and I know they'll step in financially. I also made sure to tell them how much I loved them and how much I was going to miss our relationship. Her dad shook my hand, and her mom, bless her heart, gave me a tearful hug before I walked out the door. From there, I drove to meet the affair partner's wife. Right now, I'm sitting in my car, just waiting for her to show up. My plan is simple. I'll tell her everything, and if necessary, I'll show her the video I've got. After that, it's up to her how she wants to handle it. If she needs someone to lean on, I'll offer her my support because no one deserves to go through this kind of pain alone. So, that's where my day is at. I still need to meet with her, pick up my kids from school, and change the locks on my house. I've already got a security system set up, so if my soon-to-be ex tries to pull any stunts, it'll all be on camera. She knows this too, so I'm not too concerned. Now, let me tell you, when the affair partner's wife showed up, I could tell right away that she sensed something was off. She tried to act all casual, but there was no hiding that nervous energy. I wasted no time and told her, I've got something to tell you, and it's not going to be easy to hear. I'm sorry you have to go through this, but my wife and your husband have been having an affair. She broke down immediately, tears flowing, but I had to keep going. I told her I found out three months ago. That's when her whole demeanor changed, her tears stopped, and her face twisted in anger. Three months ago. And you're only telling me now. What the hell? I explained everything, how I confronted my wife when I first found out, how we went through counseling because I thought maybe, just maybe, we could save the marriage. She listened, nodding, until I mentioned how they had continued seeing each other even after I confronted my wife. That's when she lost it again, sobbing harder this time. And look, I've got to stop and admit something here. Writing this down right now, I'm crying too. This poor woman didn't deserve any of this. I feel like I'm spreading someone else's misery around, and it makes me sick. She had no clue what was happening. She told me she had a bad feeling when I called her, thinking maybe something was wrong with her husband, but she had no idea it was an affair with my wife. No idea that I had caught them, or that they continued behind our backs. Her whole world just fell apart right in front of me. Then I asked if she wanted to see the video, and here's the kicker. She thought I meant some sleazy sex tape, and she looked at me in disgust. No, no, I explained. I confronted your husband yesterday, and I recorded our conversation. He admitted to everything, and I have that on video. 
She thought about it for a moment and then nodded, saying she wanted to see it. I had trimmed the video down to about a minute from the 20-minute conversation where he tried to weasel his way out. I hit play, and the second she saw his face, the tears started up again. In the clip, he's apologizing, saying he screwed up, and giving me more details about their ongoing affair. I asked her if she was sure she wanted to keep watching, and when she nodded, I let the video play to the end. When it was over, there wasn't much more to say. I told her how sorry I was that she had to hear this from me. She thanked me for opening her eyes to the truth. I told her I understood exactly what she was feeling because I went through the same thing three months ago. I offered her my number, telling her if she ever needed to vent, yell, or just talk, she could call me. She thanked me again, and we hugged before we went our separate ways. I don't know what she's going to do now, but I doubt it's going to be anything good for her husband. I feel genuinely awful for her and their kids. After that, I headed home, and my phone had been blowing up the entire time. My wife had been calling and texting non-stop since I left her earlier in the day. I checked the security footage, and she hadn't been home yet, so I made my way back. When I pulled into the driveway, there she was, sitting there, smoking, waiting for me. The second she saw my car, she started screaming, you told my parents, you lowlife piece of trash. I had expected this, so I hit record on my phone and slid it into my shirt pocket to catch the whole thing on video. She was blocking the garage, so I got out of the car and faced her. Yeah, I told them, I said calmly. They deserve to know the truth about why we're divorcing. I didn't lie or exaggerate. I told them the truth, and I told them they should still love and support you through all of this. That took the wind right out of her sails. She went from full-on rage to sobbing mess in a matter of seconds. She kept apologizing, begging me to tell her what she could do to fix things, saying she never wanted it to end up like this. I just stood there, listening to her, and when she finally ran out of steam, I told her, I've said everything I needed to say at the therapist's office today. I've got nothing more to say on the matter, I told her. I'll pick up the kids from school, feed them dinner, and you're welcome to come grab some of your things. But you're not staying here tonight. I suggest you go stay with your parents. That's when she flared up in anger. You can't keep me from my children, she shouted. I stayed calm. I'm not trying to keep you from them, but right now, with how upset you are, I don't think it's best for them to see you like this. I'll tell them you're staying with Grandma and Gramps for a few days, because Gramps hasn't been feeling well, and you want to help out around the house. They'll understand, and they won't ask any questions. But we need to figure out how and when we're going to explain the truth to them, and it has to happen before the week's over. She started sobbing again, and for a moment, my heart broke. I saw a glimpse of the woman I used to love, the woman I married, the woman I once thought I'd spend the rest of my life with. She looked so lost, so hopeless. I couldn't help myself, so I hugged her, whispering that I was sorry it had come to this, but her choices led us here. I told her I couldn't stand by any longer, pretending to be married to someone who had treated me this way. We stood there, her crying into my shoulder in the middle of the driveway. After what felt like forever, she pulled away and tried to kiss me. That's when I stepped back and said, that's not going to happen. She broke down again, sobbing even harder this time. I turned and walked inside the house. My mind was spinning, so I poured myself a stiff drink in the kitchen. After about twenty minutes, I heard her come inside. She didn't say a word as she went straight to our bedroom to pack a bag. I stayed in the kitchen, staring at the glass in my hand until she walked in, suitcase in tow. She looked at me with this cold expression and said, I hope you're happy. I sighed. Happy? No, I'm not happy at all. I replied. I didn't want any of this. I wanted you. I wanted us. I wanted a wife who loved me and treated me with respect. Instead, this is what I get. So no, I'm far from happy. That's when she snapped, screaming, then why are you doing this? 
Why are you throwing everything away? I looked her dead in the eye and said, I'm not the one who threw everything away. You did that when you went back to him. I'm just picking up the pieces now. She hurled a few more insults my way, but I wasn't biting. When she realized I wasn't going to argue, she stormed out, slamming the door so hard that a picture frame in the hallway fell off the wall. I heard her tires screech as she sped out of the driveway. I stayed in the kitchen, finished my drink, and replayed the video of her screaming at me. At least I had enough footage to cover myself legally if things went south. Later, I picked up the kids from school and brought them home. I explained that mom was going to stay with grandma and gramps for a few days. They looked sad but didn't ask many questions. We played for a bit, had dinner, and now they're getting ready for bed. I haven't heard from my soon-to-be ex-wife, the affair partner, or his wife in hours. The house is about to get real quiet once the kids are asleep, and I'm already preparing to keep myself company with a bottle and a few more drinks before bed. I mentioned earlier that I talked to the affair partner's wife on Friday. She told me she's not ready to end their marriage, that they're staying together and trying to make it work, they've started counseling, and with kids in the picture, I can't blame her for wanting to give it another shot. I did the same thing when I was in her shoes. Their kids don't know anything yet, and honestly, I wish them the best. I hope they can fix things. She asked me not to reach out to her while they work through it, and I'm going to respect that. I hope they can salvage what they have. As for me and my wife, we had another therapy session on Friday. This time, it was all about how to tell the kids. Once again, she begged me not to go through with the divorce, repeating over and over that she didn't want it to happen. I told her, flat out, that she made the choice for me when she decided to go back to him after I explicitly told her not to. She tried to deny it, claiming they hadn't slept together since I found out. She insisted that all they talked about was how to handle the mess we were in, and nothing more. When I confronted her with the facts I already knew, she broke down again, admitting that she knew it was wrong but didn't consider the consequences at the time. She said she just needed someone to confide in and claimed she couldn't talk to anyone else about it. Not even me, her husband, who she was supposedly trying to rebuild things with. That's when it really hit me. Even when I consider forgiving her, trying to work things out, all I can think about is the constant lies. She keeps digging herself deeper with every story she spins, lying about not sleeping with him, lying about what they discussed. It comes so naturally to her that I realize I can never trust her again. She lies so convincingly that sometimes I think even she believes it. And if I didn't have all the information, I might have fallen for it too. But I know better now. So, in those moments when I want to hold her, to kiss her, and tell her everything's going to be okay, I remind myself of all the deception. Keeps me focused on moving forward without her. We ended up telling the kids on Friday night. It was awful as expected. They're old enough to understand what's happening, and they're a mess. They're angry at her for having a boyfriend, but they're also mad at me for leaving her. She didn't want me to tell them about the boyfriend, but I stood firm on that part. They deserve the truth. The kids have their first therapy session this Friday, and I can only hope it helps them start processing everything. Meanwhile, I'm trying to stay strong as a parent, giving them the space to feel their emotions, while also being firm when I need to be. Their whole world is falling apart, and all I can do is be there for them as best as I can. It's a tricky balancing act. Yes, I tell the kids it's okay to be upset, to cry, or even to yell if they need to. But no, it's not okay to break their toys just because they're mad. There's been a lot of stuff like that lately. On Friday night, my soon-to-be ex-wife came back to the house. For now, we're stuck cohabitating until we figure out who's moving out and when. We'll have to sell the house eventually because there's no way I can afford to keep it, pay child support, and cover alimony, no matter how much that ends up being. The housing market around here is in the gutter right now, and no one's buying, so we agreed to hold off until spring to sell. Hopefully, we can get a better price by then. Still, 
the next four months can't go by fast enough for me. Christmas is going to be miserable. I can't even muster the energy to put up decorations. The idea of celebrating anything right now just feels so out of place. But I'll do it for the kids. I want them to have as normal a Christmas as possible. I just need to find the time and the mental strength to drag the tree out of storage and get it set up. She's sleeping on the couch these days. As much as I want to be the bigger person and give her our bed, I just can't do it. I even put a lock on the bedroom door and make sure to lock it before I leave for work every morning, so she can't get in there and mess with my stuff. She's using the guest room and living out of a suitcase. Call it petty, call it a dick move. I don't care. She left me, so I'm going to sleep in my own bed, and she can suffer on the couch. The house has been relatively calm. She's barely talking to me, and when she does, it's just about the kids. No more yelling or dramatic outbursts. I'm sure there's a lot brewing under the surface with her. There always is, but for now, she's being civil. First off, everything's still cordial and respectful, which is a relief. The tension was thick during that first week, but it's eased up a lot as we've all settled into this awkward new normal. Honestly, it gives me some hope that we can handle things amicably going forward. I know it's hard to believe after everything she's put me through, but she's been fairly straightforward and hasn't pulled any new tricks. Well, with one notable exception. As for me, I've stayed firm in my resolve to move forward. Second, putting up the Christmas decorations turned out to be a great experience for the kids. We played Christmas music, watched holiday movies, and didn't take anything too seriously. The soon-to-be ex-wife helped out, too, since she's still living here. I couldn't exactly keep her from joining in. She directed the kids while they hung ornaments on the tree, and I put the lights up outside. We all came inside afterward, had hot cocoa, and watched Christmas Vacation. I sat on one side of the kids, and she sat on the other. In previous years, we would have been cuddled up together on the couch, but that's not happening anymore. Third, the kids' therapy is going well. The first session was mostly paperwork and introductions, nothing too heavy. The kids were understandably shy and unsure about how it was all going to work. Having both of us in the room probably didn't help. It seemed to make them a little more guarded. But the second session went a lot better. We started together, and after some time, the therapist asked us to step out so she could talk to the kids alone. We waited outside for about 15 minutes, and when we came back in, the kids shared what they had talked about. They expressed a lot of sadness and uncertainty and said they didn't want us to get divorced or live in separate houses. Then came the kicker. My soon-to-be ex started crying and said, I don't want that either. I just sat there, dumbfounded, thinking, are you kidding me? I had to bite my tongue to stop myself from blurting out. Then maybe you shouldn't have cheated on me. But instead, like an idiot, I chimed in with, I don't want that either, though it felt like I was just echoing her words. Afterward, I asked the therapist if we could speak privately before leaving. With about five minutes left in the session, the therapist had the kids wait in the lobby. That's when she turned to my wife and let her have it. She called her out for being manipulative, telling her to stop making me out to be the bad guy with comments like that. She told her that if she truly didn't want the divorce, she should have thought about the consequences before starting the affair. It was everything I'd wanted to say but hadn't been able to. Honestly, it was kind of awesome to hear someone else say it. Later that night, my soon-to-be ex apologized for what she said in therapy. She told me she'd try to be more mindful of how her words affect the kids. That's where things stand for now. It's about as much as I could have hoped for, given the circumstances. Aside from that, work is going well, and the Christmas preparations are coming together. Oh, and here's the kicker. I accidentally slept with my wife. Yeah, that's the exception to my resolve that I mentioned earlier. Let me explain what happened. Rewind to the night we put up the Christmas decorations. It had been a really nice day. We all enjoyed ourselves. 
The kids had a blast, and we wrapped it up by watching some holiday movies together. It felt almost like it used to before everything fell apart. After putting the kids to bed, we sat down to finish watching It's a Wonderful Life, which happens to be her favorite Christmas movie. We had both been sipping on eggnog and brandy throughout the night, and between the warm atmosphere and the alcohol, I didn't realize how much it had clouded my judgment. Out of nowhere, she leaned over and kissed my neck, soft and familiar. I turned to her, and before I knew it, we were at it like a couple of teenagers. And yes, the whole time I was thinking, don't do this, but I went against my better judgment and did it anyway. It had been so long since we'd been together like that, and I wasn't in my right mind. That said, it was, well, it was good. But as soon as it was over, I just felt this overwhelming sense of disgust with myself. After everything she did, after all the progress I'd made, I just felt sick for giving in. I told her that night that nothing had changed between us, that I still wanted a divorce. I made it clear it couldn't happen again and that we weren't going back to the way things used to be. She said she agreed, but honestly, who knows with her. I haven't had the chance to bring it up with my therapist or in our marriage counseling sessions yet. And yeah, now I've got to go get an STD test because who knows what she might have picked up from the affair partner. At least I don't have to worry about pregnancy since I had a vasectomy years ago. But the whole situation has me completely baffled. How could I have been so stupid and let my guard down like that? I'm sorry if I've let anyone down with what happened. I'm not perfect, and I'm still angry with myself, but I won't let it happen again. My wife and I ultimately decided to try and make it work. I know that's going to disappoint some people, and believe me, I wrestled with disappointment in myself for most of last year. We're not back to 100% and I'm not sure we ever will be, but things are better now. It took about 9 months of intensive therapy, both individually and together along with family therapy for the kids, to reach this point. We both had to be willing to forgive and move forward. Frankly, it feels like a miracle that we've made it this far. So here's how it all went down. I laid down the boundary that we couldn't sleep together again. We kept going to couples therapy and eventually she started to open up about what was really going on in her head, why she went back to the affair partner and what she was feeling. Around March, something shifted between us. We weren't just going through the motions anymore. We were genuinely talking, being honest with each other. She confessed her deep fears about losing herself in the roles of wife and mother, how she felt like she was missing something, and how she went looking for it outside of our marriage. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't falling for some sob story. I truly believe she was lost and trying to fill a void. Should she have come to me for that? Absolutely. But she didn't, and I've chosen to forgive her for it. I, in turn, expressed the depth of my hurt, my pain, and how shattered my trust had become. I'm still afraid of getting burned again, to be honest. I know it could happen, but I've learned to let go of my need to control every little thing. I've placed my faith in her and in something bigger than both of us, trusting that she won't do this to me again. I'm the kind of person who thrives on having a plan, knowing what steps I'll take if I ever doubt her loyalty or find evidence of her cheating again. It gives me strength and helps me keep the hurt at bay. For months, all I could think about was the cheating, the lying. Now, it hardly crosses my mind. She hasn't spoken to or contacted the affair partner in over a year, and I know that because I have access to her phone, laptop, and Facebook messages. She agreed to it, and for a long time, I checked them obsessively. I wanted to go through every message, question every text. But over time, that need faded. I always made sure to check at random moments, without warning, just in case. But honestly, I haven't checked in about two months, and I don't plan to unless I start feeling suspicious again. Therapy helped a lot with that. As for the affair partner and his wife, I haven't spoken to either of them since I last reached out in December. And frankly, I'm okay with that. From what I've seen on Facebook, they're still married, but I don't dwell on it. I don't even check her profile anymore. 
I've muted her so she doesn't show up in my feed. The last time I looked was maybe three or four months ago, and I just don't care what happens to them anymore. We've also distanced ourselves from the old group of friends we used to hang out with and have built new friendships. It's not that our old friends were bad people, but they were part of a lifestyle we no longer wanted to be around. Heavy drinking, bragging about money, all that. They weren't toxic, but they didn't align with the direction we want to go as a couple. Our new group is still social and fun, but without the excess. It's more focused on family, positivity, and building something healthier together. We spent New Year's Eve 2024 with our old group of friends and woke up on New Year's Day feeling hungover and pretty much useless. This year, we celebrated with our new group, and while we still had a great time, we made it home early enough to enjoy the day with our kids. It was a refreshing change, being able to wake up on New Year's Day and actually feel good. The kids now know we're staying together. Over the summer, June or July, we decided to put the divorce proceedings on hold. Originally, we were supposed to be done by March or April, but we pushed it back. Honestly, the process of going through our things, trying to decide who would get what, was exhausting. I think that was a big factor in her decision to open up and work on things, and it made me more willing to give us another chance. We told the kids we were no longer getting divorced. We explained that sometimes, moms and dads have to work through really tough stuff, and we were going to keep trying. In August, she moved back into our bedroom, and I took the lock off the door. Life isn't perfect, but it's better, and it keeps improving day by day. On Christmas, she apologized again for everything she had put me through and promised to keep working every single day to rebuild my trust and love. The truth is, I do love her, maybe even more now than before. I finally understand how couples can survive something like this. We're planning a family vacation for spring break, and we're all really looking forward to it. We still go to couples therapy once a week, and both of us continue individual therapy, though not as often. Our marriage counselor even told us she's amazed at how we've managed to handle everything and how we've committed to healing the cracks in our marriage. It wasn't easy for a long time, but it's easier now than it was. I want to be as clear as possible about how we made it work. I know the rest of this story might be a little vague, but I want to give you the specific steps that helped us heal, in case it helped someone else. I'm no expert, but this is what worked for us. First therapy, both individual and couples therapy, was essential. My individual therapy helped me confront my own shortcomings as a man, husband.